Looks like the Rosetta congregation has grown a little bit since I was here last time. <laughs> but uh, they invited me to say something about the recent court case in Scotland, and I'm very glad to do that. And we'll try in a few minutes to hit the high spots of the hearing so that you might uh, know what the hearing was all about and also understand the purpose of the society in connection with it. There's been a great deal of publicity given this case, especially in the British Isles, but not in the British Isles alone. It's been in the uh, press of other countries to some extent. I don't know if it's been in your local newspapers or not, but I doubt it very much. But Jehovah's people all over the earth have heard about it. And uh, it is so important to the society and to the work in Scotland. And our hearts are in that part of the field as well as all other parts of the field. And therefore, it is of interest to us. In uh, the British Isles, as you, of course, are aware, there are uh, draft laws that compare with our selective service laws in this country, the purpose being to conscript men for the army of uh, the United Kingdom. The laws of uh, the United Kingdom, including Scotland, make certain provisions for religious denominations and for the uh, ministers of religion, regular ministers of religion, who are uh, appointed by religious denominations, you see. So the situation in respect to the conscription laws are, is very similar to that which we are familiar with here in the United States, and we know all about that because it has been an issue with us and many of our brothers for many, many years throughout uh, World War One and throughout World War Two, and uh, throughout uh, the present efforts to uh, conscript uh, men for the military forces of this country. So that isn't new to us. But uh, the situation that existed in uh, Scotland is new to us here because in the United States of America, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is recognized as a religious denomination under the law, and so it is, and properly so recognized. However, in the, the British Isles, and we're speaking now of Scotland specifically, it has been held in previous court proceedings that the International Bible Students Association, which is the British corporation which the society uses, incorporated in Great Britain in 1914, is not a religious denomination. And uh, while it was held that the congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses are religious in uh, some holdings, uh, its ministers, that is the ministers of the International Bible Students Association and appointed by that association are not regular ministers of religion. So that has left uh, the society at a disadvantage in uh, contending the proper exemption for its ministers. And that was true in Scotland. The society prosecuted the uh, present case that we're discussing for the purpose of establishing uh, two things primarily. One, that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society itself is a religious denomination under the law and they should be so recognized. And we wanted to get a uh, court decision to this effect because a court decision is part of law. Furthermore, we wanted to establish that the appointees of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society are regular ministers of religion under the law. 
as it has been established in the United States. And it was proper to make this effort because it's proper to take advantage of that which the law provides. In some countries, for instance, uh, in Greece, there is no provision along those lines, so our brothers there who are confronted with the issue have to fight it out each time on the basis of their own stamina and uh, on the basis of the reaction of the men with whom they have to deal. But here we have a democratic nation, Britain, with laws making certain provisions that we wanted to take advantage of. So that, you see, is the uh, background of this case. It was uh, very, very important for the work in the British Isles, but not that alone because it would uh, extend an influence throughout the uh, British uh, Dominion or Commonwealth of Nations in the rest of the English-speaking world, all of the Stirling area as, as it is commonly called. We know of the fight that's been on in the courts in Canada and uh, the position that has been established there, which is very good. And we wanted, if possible, to duplicate that in, uh, the, in uh, the British Isles, you see. There are seats up front. You come right ahead and take them. Now, in uh, the immediate case, there was a very splendid uh, set of circumstances that constituted a test case to establish this. A young brother by the name of Walsh, Douglas Walsh, born in uh, England, but uh, whose parents moved to Glasgow, Scotland at an early, when he was an early, early age, just a little tot, came into the truth and symbolized his dedication when he was 12 years of age. He was very young. Thereafter, he went into the pioneer work, appointed uh, by the society. Thereafter, became congregation servant of uh, one of the units of Glasgow, Scotland, where he's done a good job. And then when he uh, was called upon to respond for induction into the military forces, he did not claim uh, exemption as a conscientious objector, but as a regular minister of religion, he did not respond, and... Uh, that gave rise to this present case, you see. We had as the subject around which the case revolved this young pioneer and congregation servant. So as far as the society's appointees in this immediate case uh, are concerned, it uh, has been the pioneer and the congregation servant that is involved. And uh, it was to establish by court order or ruling that uh, Walsh is exempt and uh, that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, his ecclesiastical governing body, is a regular minister, or is a regular uh, uh, religious denomination under the laws of Great Britain, namely Scotland here. Now that was uh, quite a job because as I pointed out, there have been previous court decisions held to, holding to the contrary, the most recent of which was the Salt Marsh case, in which a man who was a member of the Bethel family in London and uh, a traveling representative of the society failed to establish himself at law as a regular minister of religion, was held to be a uh, book-distributing representative of a uh, book-distributing tract society, the International Bible Students Association of Great Britain. And uh, it was uh, held in court that he had received his appointment from the International Bible Students Association. And the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society was not on trial in that, that particular case, although there have been previous uh, court contests in the British Isles where the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society was involved. The society uh, felt the case important enough that it uh, wanted to send some witnesses to give testimony from America and wished to have uh, men representing it there and giving testimony as expert witnesses qualified to uh, testify upon the matters concerning which they came to speak. It was for this reason that Brother Covington was sent over 
as uh, an expert witness on uh, corporation law in the United States and uh, re religious law as it's been applied and built up in the United States and also an authority in speaking concerning the society and its organization. Brother Franz, the uh, vice president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, was sent over as uh, an expert witness, particularly on the history of the society and on uh, theology, specifically our own tenets and beliefs. And it was my privilege to also go as a witness in behalf of Walsh, the uh, pursuer in this case. That is the man who has brought the action against the crown. Here we'd call him the uh, plaintiff. There he's called the pursuer. So it was an action on the part of Walsh or on the part of the society suing the crown, uh, the queen, but uh, representative of the government. As uh, here, when we have cases against the uh, United States, we bring suit against the government. So the point is that it was the society taking this move and fighting this case on behalf of Walsh and on behalf of all the other brothers in the British Isles, on behalf of the uh, society itself, on behalf of Jehovah's uh, word and name and to establish his work in a favorable status uh, to be carried on in the British Isles. So that's the reason we three fellows were sent over there. Brother Covington went in on uh, November the 11th, nearly a week before Franz and myself, who uh, went over on the 17th. Walsh was uh, there, of course. We had our own uh, brothers from uh, the London Bethel who were of service in the case and also various legal uh, representatives whom I'll describe to you later. Franz and I went on uh, November the uh, 17th, as I said, on Wednesday, flying over on British Overseas Airlines we're told before we left uh, New York that it was foggy in London, which is you know, expected, I guess, but that uh, planes were landing. We might be a little bit late, and we were. It was foggy in London, so we landed in Ireland for a while and then went on to London. We were told we'll fly around, and if the fog lifts, we'll land. If not, we shall land elsewhere in the British Isles. But the fog lifted after we flew over London for an hour and three quarters, and we went down through a hole in the fog, and thereafter the fog closed in again and the airport was a fog bound the next day. The brothers who left uh, London Bethel to meet us, that is Covington and Hughes and uh, Reese. Hughes is the branch servant of uh, the British Isles and Reese is the office servant. And uh, Covington was our American companion. Uh, went to the airport to meet us and left in fog so thick they couldn't see across the street literally and wondered how in the world an airplane was going to come down. They thought we'd landed up there on top of the stuff, but we did get down, and that was good because they had arranged for a meeting with the London brothers that evening, uh, Thursday evening, November the 18th. And uh, it was very cold and wet, damp and foggy, and this was an outdoor meeting of 4,480 brothers in London, and they send their love to you and our other brothers here in America. That meeting lasted for two and a half hours. It was addressed by brothers Covington, Franz, and myself, and we told them something about the work here. And uh, the following day, Friday, we spent in the office of our London solicitor and uh, worked with him and our London barrister. In the British Isles, they do not have uh, creatures that compare with our lawyers, but they have a a very low form of legal life called uh, solicitors. And uh, they're the man, men whom uh, you deal with if you have a legal proceedings in the British Isles. And so we deal with the solicitor. And the solicitor in turn deals with the barrister. And it is the barrister who presents your case in court if it comes to that point. The British office being in London we had our London solicitor, a man by the name of Buena de Mesquita. A Spanish name, at least a Spanish sometime or other, but the, the fellow is absolutely a typical Englishman of his uh, type. He's a very uh, neat fellow, 
somewhat stocky, inclined to be a little uh, uh, stiff-necked. He has a short neck, and he turns his whole body when he wants to turn his head. Has a fine sense of humor and a quick mind and a great big grin and only two or three teeth in front. So when he grins, he looks like a squirrel or a, a chipmunk. And he wouldn't mind my saying that because I, I think he's proud of the fact he only has a couple of three teeth in front. Many men over there don't have uh, uh, many teeth. They don't worry so much about dentures as we seem to. Well, here, I don't know why, because the government's been uh, having socialized medicine there for a good many years. You'd think they'd all have teeth, but he didn't have then Noakes was the name of our London barrister. And uh, he's a, a decided type too, a fine man whom you like very much. Very sophisticated, quick mind, a ready talker. He can carry on a conversation about nothing more than any man I ever saw. Talk about his wife, how she moves the furniture around when he goes home. He never knows what the house is going to look like. He has a beautiful blonde wife. He loves to talk about her. Just a, a nice talkative fellow, a good uh, a social uh, associate, and a good lawyer. And we've used him a great deal in London. He has a high respect for the society and for Jehovah's Witnesses, as has Mr. Mesquita. Also from uh, London, there was, as I've said, Hughes and uh, Reese. Then in addition to Hughes and Reese from the London Bethel family, there's another brother who was with us in Edinburgh, Scotland, where the case was heard from the London Bethel. He's a typist, and he was our stenographer and was a very busy young man. His name is Clutterbuck. At first I thought it was a, a nickname because he used the typewriter, Clutterbuck, but no, that's his name. And Mosquito called him Clutterbucket. He's a very fine young fellow. <laughs> Phil. I hadn't known that boy before and was very glad to get acquainted with Brother Clutterbuck. He's a fine young man. Well, now, uh, that uh, accounts for eight of us uh, from London. And uh, Friday night, we took a night train, the night uh, Scotland Flyer, a sleeper train from London to Edinburgh. They're uh, good trains, the uh, cars are small, and on each car there are about ten uh, sleeping compartments or rooms, ten bedrooms. And we filled up almost the whole car. There were eight of us. You see, our uh, uh, solicitor and our barrister, and three of us from America and three from the British uh, branch office. We arrived in uh, Edinburgh, which is the... Uh, the capital of Scotland. It used to be the capital of the Scotch, uh, Scottish uh, nation when it was separate from England and not part of the United Kingdom, but it's still the capital of uh, that section, Scotland, the dominion. Uh, and that's not a dominion. It's an integral part of the United Kingdom. And our trial was to be held there and not in London. And it's very good, too, because we would never have been able to do what was accomplished in London. We never would have been able to do it in the United States of America either from all past experience. And I don't know a place on the face of the earth where this case could have been heard in the manner which I'll attempt to describe the way it was in, as it was in Edinburgh, Scotland because of the circumstances surrounding uh, the locale there. We arrived in Edinburgh at 6.15 on Saturday morning and uh, the court was to open with our case. The uh, next Tuesday because court is not held on Mondays. And that gave us Saturday, Sunday, and Monday to prepare, do more preparatory work. And uh, it is because of the cumbersome procedure that I've referred to that requires so much time in advanced preparation, something we're not used to here in the United States. When we got to Edinburgh early in the morning, it was dark, of course, because it's the winter season and the nights are long and the days are short up there. It's far north. When you go there next summer, you'll find the days are very long and the nights are very short in the summertime. It's reversed now. Went to our hotel, the Caledonian, a sprawling, old, luxurious place where Mosquito had reserved rooms. We had to live in the hotel because uh, 
we couldn't take these men not on the truth to the homes of our brothers there in Edinburgh, although we would have been welcome because their homes are humble. We had to work with those men all the time from early morning till late at night. And in this hotel, we had a sitting room in connection with the, the room of Mesquita and Oaks where we did our work. A large uh, room uh, suitable for our purpose, but constantly filled with smoke because Mesquita and Oaks are chain smokers. <laughs> That's the original smoke-filled room like Tammany Hall in New York or the uh, proverbial smoke-filled room at a political convention. We were in it. We were s saturated with this stuff. And these men being addicts to uh, smoking, they were not able or not inclined to forego that for the two or three weeks they anticipated the case would take. So they smoked. We smoked too, but it was all second hand. <laughs> <laughs> in the British Isles, kibbered herring is a very prominent and very delicious dish, especially for breakfast. And we were three American smoked kippers, and <laughs> they got <laughs> through with us. Well, when we got to the hotel, lo and behold, Covington's room was two floors above ours. And Mr. Mosquito, who had made the arrangement, he was provoked. And he said to the night staff on duty when he called to see the manager about this uh, mistreatment, he says, that is fantastic, that is fantastic. <laughs> but Covington says, it makes no difference to me what floor I'm on, I'm going to my room. We all said we're going to our room, so Mr. Mosquito calmed down, and afterwards he said he shouldn't have lost his temper that way. He didn't lose his temper, that's just the way he is. He, he's like the fellow said about his wife, my uh, uh, wife has an even temper, mad all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he's not really that way, though, because, as I said, he has a good sense of humor. But he wanted uh, things to suit him, and he's that type of a man, but he wasn't quick with us or short-tempered with us at all, but very respectful and helpful. We appreciated his services. We spent that day working at the hotel out of our large windows uh, across the beautiful gardens. There could be seen the great castle of Edinburgh. If any of you have been there, you know how you can see that from Princes Street. An impregnable fortress in its day, one which the British never succeeded in capturing when they invaded Scotland and of which the Scottish people are very proud. They're not Scotch people. Scotch is something that they make in that land, but the people are Scotsmen or, or uh, Scottish. But they're not Scotch. They don't like to be called Scotch. Any of you brothers are, are Scottish, you'll back me up in that statement. The uh, solid rock constituting uh, the base of this fortress rises, they say, a thousand feet in the air. Perhaps it does. It appeared to... And uh, it was up there near this uh, uh, great old castle that the old parliament buildings were located, where the parliament was held before uh, Scotland was part of the United Kingdom. And it is in the old parliament buildings that the courts are held. And that's where our case was heard. A nice walk from our hotel or a short uh, taxi ride if the weather was... Uh, very rainy as it was much of the time. We uh, worked all day Sunday. We weren't even able to go to the uh, meetings of the congregation there because we were confined to this preparation. And I know you're saying, why do you talk about uh, work so much? Well, here's the situation. We know what we want. We understand the truth. We knew what the society wanted. But we were dealing with men who are not in the truth. Now, since the case was in Edinburgh, we had to have an Edinburgh solicitor. He was a man uh, named uh, McPhee, a very fine man whom uh, I grew to like very much, quiet. He wears uh, horn-rimmed glasses. He always, he always wears them down on his nose like this and looks over them all the time because they're not bifocals enough. If he wants to look off, he looks like this he wants to read, it's like this. So all the time McPhee's going around these glasses on the end of his nose like <laughs> he's, he's pink-cheeked and has a big mustache, very neat fellow, very kindly man, as are the Scottish people in general. 
But uh, he was not a barrister. He's our Edinburgh solicitor. And for our barrister to actually present the case in court, we had the best attorney in all of Scotland, a man by the name of John Cameron. He's the dean of the uh, faculty of barristers at the Edinburgh University. So his name is, or his title and proper means of address is Dean Cameron or Mr. Dean. He got in our case last January along with his associate in our case named Emsley. Emsley argued before the court in January and was associated uh, in the past hearing that I'm referring to. Dean Cameron was made a knight by, or knighted by the queen since he got in our case. Not because he got in our case, but since then. So now he's Sir John Cameron, Queen's Counsel, and uh, is addressed as Sir John, or uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Dean, or Dean Cameron, or, or Sir John Cameron. But they take their titles very seriously, and he was greatly honored by the Queen and was slated for a judgeship. But he didn't want to move to London, he told me, and live there. And I don't blame him because Edinburgh is a beautiful place to live, but London is not. And besides, he makes more money in private practice. So why should he have a, a judgeship at this stage in life? Because he has a family who travel extensively and uh, he uh, needs to have a good private practice. But the point is we had the best lawyer in Scotland and uh, the most uh, prominent one and the one whose word carries the greatest weight with judges and other men alike. Probably the most brilliant lawyer was Emsley. He recently had a, uh, a lawsuit in which the dean was his opponent and Emsley uh, won this lawsuit, uh, won from the dean in another lawsuit. And those two men were our barristers in Edinburgh. Now in addition to them, since Walsh hails from Glasgow, we had to have a Glasgow solicitor who was uh, Walsh's solicitor from the outset. So it meant that we were uh, dealing with and paying seven lawyers, where in, the Amer in America we would have done it with one. And if we would have had Brother Covington, we wouldn't have had to pay him anything. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way it works there, and we can't change the procedure. We weren't going under American law. We were going in under... under uh, uh, Scottish law, naturally. Now that's why it was such a heartbreaking job in preparation. The thing had been pending since January in preparation proceeding uh, to some extent, and Brother Covington was there nearly a week ahead of our arrival, and his uh, order of proof, as it is called, was worked up. And then when we got there, we worked on uh, Fran's order of proof and on mine and then on the order of proof of the other witnesses. We had altogether seven witnesses. We have to go over everything in detail with everyone concerned. Over and over the same thing time and again. But they grasped it. Our solicitors and barristers understood. But the procedure is you go over these things with your attorney and I mean with your solicitor and discuss the points you want to make so they understand it. And then they put it down on paper. They dictated it to Clutterbuck. <laughs> Clutterbuck got it down on paper. And then is this paper that's presented to the dean by the solicitor. And then in conferences with the dean, the man who's going to talk to the court, uh, enlargement on the uh, comparatively brief uh, order of proof as it is called this typewritten document that is the basis for the questioning and argument of the dean uh, is gone into well that takes uh, a terrific amount of time and we wondered sometimes in the days past what was being accomplished but that's what was being done and that's why it was necessary that uh, a pro uh, practically three weeks were spent in developing and uh, conducting a case that actually occupied uh, nine days of time in the court. But that's a long court proceeding, a court proceeding of nine days. Just before we were uh, due to open in court with our case, that would be uh, on Monday night, the court opening 
the following day, Tuesday, November the 23rd, at the final conference with the dean, it was decided that our order of procedure would be altered. And whereas the attorneys in Covington had determined previously to that, that Covington would be our first witness, it was decided much to our uh, uh, mutual agreement, all concerned, all of us, that our first witness would be Franz, because it was determined that we would lead with our tenets and the history of the society, and uh, therefore we would lead with the Bible, and Franz is the man to do that, and not Covington, and not me, and that Covington and I could substantiate uh, what uh, Franz said to the extent needed and could uh, add to his testimony. But under Scottish rules of evidence, it's necessary that evidence be presented by at least two witnesses if it's to be accepted as truthful in the event that it's challenged. If evidence is presented by one witness and unchallenged, it can be accepted by the court as true, but we wanted to have everything proved by two witnesses. Well, that accounts for the fact that Franz led off and I am sure, I am sure, as we are all assured, that it was the direction of Jehovah. The uh, society, in endeavoring to establish its main contentions, that are correct contentions, that it is a separate religious denomination, and uh, its servants are especially appointed and regular ministers of religion and set apart for that purpose and hands laid upon them for that purpose, wanted to establish that it has, or Jehovah's Witnesses has, the society has, tenets that are exclusive and unique and that are not held by any other religion. That would establish us on the basis of doctrine as a separate religious organization or denomination and uh, also we wanted to establish that we have a substantial membership. We wish to establish that we exercise, that is, I say we, I mean the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And that's what I mean when I refer to society. That the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society exercises ecclesiastical powers, including powers of appointment. That it has an organization that is... Uh, not nebulous, but strong, and uh, is non-profit, and is not a book-selling organization. Well, you can see that to establish these things in open court laid open the whole society, our teachings and our organization for minute examination and that's exactly what occurred. And I say that I believe that never in the history of the world at any time has the beliefs and organization of any religious organization been delved into so thoroughly as those of Jehovah's Witnesses and the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And this proceedings just ended in Scotland. And I also believe that never before in the history of the Court of Sessions of Scotland, in which this case was heard, has there been so much searching into God's word as there was during these, uh, this hearing just concluded. And that was a wonderful and thrilling thing. On the witness stand, uh, Brother Franz proceeded along the line I've mentioned of establishing these points, and the uh, method of procedure is that under direct or chief examination by the dean, points were brought out and established under oath by the witness. Then each witness is subject to cross-examination by the counsel for the crown, a man by the name of Leslie. And then uh, he's subject to redirect examination by our own attorney, the dean, Dean Cameron. There was a great amount of repetition on the part of all the witnesses for the reason that I've stated to establish a thing by two witnesses on our part. And then because of the fact that Leslie, the Crown's attorney, our opponent, 
continually went after certain things with each witness. So what I remark about testimony being given may apply to one witness, it may apply to all, or it may apply to uh, two or more of the witnesses. And I'll make no effort to distinguish between witnesses and say Brother Fran said this and Brother Covington said that and I said this and somebody else said something else, but rather to uh, highlight some of the points of the testimony as a whole. It was shown under testimony backed up by long readings from the scriptures just as you do on a back call or with a Bible study concerning our tenets. And it was a thrilling thing to hear them discussed in open court. We all had our Bibles with us. And not only that, but we supplied eight Bibles to the court and to our uh, barristers and solicitors. We supplied a good Bible with uh, uh, print easy to read to the judge. Now, it was the same judge that heard the preliminary hearing in January, a man by the name of Strawn, who is a lord, Lord Strawn, and who is addressed by individuals in the court as my lord or your lordship. And at the time of that preliminary hearing, he handed down a written opinion that we are not a religious denomination and that our uh, pioneers are just mere call porters or book distributors. But he did agree to take it into court and allow our case to proceed to court, and he heard the case. And it may be, we think it may be, that the reason he was assigned to hear our case is because he's a strongly religious man and in fact has been the counsel to the Church of Scotland of which he is a member and therefore qualified with his uh, fine uh, legal background and religious background uh, it was probably believed to hear a case of this kind a religious controversy in court now as far as Leslie is concerned the Crown's counsel he's from the Orkney Islands which are off the north coast of Scotland and he has a very beautiful voice deep and resonant. It's a pleasure to hear him, and he uses his voice effectively before juries where people are uh, influenced by even the sound of a man's voice, and he has a, a wonderful accent. It was a pleasure to hear the man talk. But he started out in life to be a Presbyterian minister, and it may be that he was assigned to our case since January because they did change their attorneys because of his religious background as well as being a good lawyer. And that worked well for us because he, with his uh, a religious background, got sidetracked on doctrine and got clear away from the legal issues involved in the case before the court and uh, wasted lots and lots of time from the standpoint of uh, the legal issues, but he didn't waste the time really from the standpoint of giving a witness to the truth and emphasizing the truth as his cross-examinations uh, revealed. So that was the, the setting. Now, uh, it was established then from uh, Bible citations and Bible quotations concerning all of our doctrines, the intimate things of our faith, things that uh, make up our religious life, it was proved that Jehovah's Witnesses believe in only one God. His name is Jehovah. That we accept the Bible as God's word of truth and the exclusive and inspired revelation of God. The uh, tenet relative to Christ Jesus and his relationship to his heavenly Father and along with that, the rejection of the Trinity doctrine, the work of the ransom, or through the ransom, God, uh, Jesus' relationship not only to God but to man as well. It was explained from the scriptures concerning the fact that the Gentile times had ended in 1914, that Armageddon was ahead, 
and that there was an urgency in our work of giving testimony to the kingdom which impelled us to utilize uh, all modern means of communication and education and particularly the printed page because oral sermons uh, were inadequate to do the work that must be done according to our belief, you see, before Armageddon. And that was emphasized very, very strongly. It was pointed out, too, concerning our beliefs on uh, the mortality of the soul and the rejection of the immortality theory, the rejection of the eternal torment theory, and purgatory, and uh, such things as the responsibility upon the remnant of God's anointed, the remnant of the members of the body of Christ upon the earth, and uh, the prophecy of the 24th chapter of Matthew, verses 45 to 47, concerning the faithful and wise servant, the King James Bible being used chiefly throughout our trial, which is their Bible, gone into. So imagine now, for practically two days, Brother Franz was on the stand discussing these things under direct and under cross-examination. And uh, when he'd refer to scriptures, as he did constantly, uh, quoting most of them, but frequently turning to the Bible, so people would know he was reading from the Bible with his ready uh, grasp of the scriptures, both as to their content and their location. Then uh, when he would turn to the scriptures, the judge would turn to the place in his Bible and follow Brother Franz, and so would Leslie, and so would Dean Cameron and... Uh, Emsley and Miss Hutchinson, another attorney associated with them on our side, and so would Mesquita, and so would Noakes, and of course we all would too. So it was a thrilling thing to see everyone in the courtroom that was involved in the case, and many who were not involved, following the discussion in the Bible. We gave Mesquita a Bible to use, we thought, but he latched onto it and marked it all up. And he'd come in the courtroom, he, the benches are narrow, you squeeze in and sit down on little old benches with just a little ledge to put your papers on. And we sat in a row in back of Mesquita and Noakes and uh, 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 McPhee and Burns Reed, the Glasgow solicitor, and their clerks or clerks. Then in front of them were the uh, barristers, uh, Cameron and Emsley, whom I mentioned, and Miss Hutchinson whom I forgot to mention, but she was also, she's also a barrister, just admitted to the law. So, uh, Mosquito would come in, sit down, open up his briefcase, get out his Bible and plunk it down on the stand in front of you, ready for action. <laughs> so he'd say, uh, where's my Bible, where's my Bible? <laughs> One day, he had an interview at the dean's house, and he forgot his Bible and left it there. The dean has a, a study in his home, and that's customary. The lawyers in Scotland don't have offices. They uh, have interviews in their homes. Al although the dean is the only lawyer who does have an office. He has an office uh, in the parliament building. So uh, Mosquito left his Bible there at uh, the dean's home the night before, and he came to court, didn't have his Bible. And he stewed around about that, and where's my Bible, where's my Bible? And finally he... Recall, he must have left it at the dean's place. So he went up to the dean, and you must remember that uh, there's class distinction there. As I said, a solicitor is a low form of legal life, and a sir is a high, high form of legal life. We don't understand their point of view. And, uh, it didn't mean anything to us, but it means a lot to them. So finally he went up to the dean, and he says, uh, may I ask you a, a bit of Scottish... Uh, law advice free and Dean says what is it he says what's the penalty in Scotland for stealing a man's Bible <laughs> <laughs> the Dean said oh yes you left that at my home so he sent his clerk to his home to get Mosquito's Bible so Mosquito could be happy again and so Mosquito could follow the uh, testimony given in court in his Bible in uh, <clears throat> discussing this matter of uh, our being a denomination it's very clear to us, I'm sure, uh, you're not uh, in dark as to the point we have in mind, 
We know that Christianity is not divided up into sects and denominations. We know that the worship of Jehovah isn't a sectarian thing or a denominational thing, but a denomination is a name, you see. It identifies uh, religious organizations. The worship of Jehovah isn't uh, a sectarian thing, but it is different from other religions. And since the law makes provisions for religious denominations, we should have advantage of those provisions, if there are any advantages in them, you see. And we have to fight for the proclamation of the truth. It's like uh, Mesquita caught on in discussing the matter before uh, the proceedings began. He made the remark on his own volition. He said, I see that this is not a religion. This is religion. And from that point of view, he's right. And we wanted to establish that in court. Well, you can readily see that uh, going into these various things opened uh, us wide open for cross-examination on uh, all these points because they're subject to cross-examination. And we went into our doctrines extensively to show the urgency upon the organization and that because we use literature does not make us a book-selling tract society. And uh, to show the responsibility upon the anointed remnant because we had to prove that we have a governing body and the responsibility is upon God's anointed to conduct the work of Jehovah's Witnesses upon the earth, you see. Now, uh, in the United States of America, we're incorporated. They don't have corporations in England like we have here or in Scotland. But it had to be shown that in the United States it's common practice for a religious denomination to incorporate itself or incorporate its governing bodies. And uh, it's in Pennsylvania that Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is incorporated. And it's incorporated under the non-profit corporation laws of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, not under the religious corporation laws. And uh, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society Incorporated of New York is incorporated under the membership corporation laws of New York State, not under the religious corporation laws. But it was demonstrated that that is common practice in America because the religious corporation laws make provisions for corporations which are comparatively restricted, you see, like uh, uh, you might have a corporation in this congregation to hold title to the property or something like that. It's more or less restricted on a small scale, but for an organization that is to carry on its work throughout a whole nation, as uh, the United States branch corporation does, or throughout the whole world, as the Pennsylvania corporation does, it is customary to incorporate religious organizations under the nonprofit and membership corporation laws. So those things are unheard of in the British Isles. They just don't have such provisions in their corporation laws. So that had to be gone into extensively. And it was shown that here's the responsibility. Upon God's anointed to preach the gospel of the kingdom and their relationship to the uh, Jonadab class was shown scripturally, their unity, their working together, the tightness of the organization. And that also here is a corporation uh, properly incorporated under law with the uh, other religious denominations similarly incorporated, such as the Lutherans here in the United States and uh, the Latter-day Saints or Mormons here in the United States, you see. Common practice. So where these two circles cross or intersect, we have a segment that is of the anointed remnant. We have a segment that is the directing head of the corporation an ecclesiastical body, and that the board of directors of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society constitute the spokesman for all the remnant throughout the earth. The governing body of the Lord's work throughout the earth is all the remnant, and that the uh, spokesman for the board of directors is the society's president. And it was established beyond any question 
that since 1931 and uh, the steps taken subsequently thereafter up until 1938 specifically, there was a change in the structure of our society from democratic to theocratic. And at one point the judge interrupted the witness and says, what do you, uh, explain to me what you mean by a theocratic organization, you see. A, a wonderful uh, development to take place in court and one of countless where the interest of all were centered upon such things as a theocratic organization and things of doctrine and so forth, you see. And it was established that we are not a hierarchical organization and we refuse to be compared even for the purpose of making a legal point to a hierarchical organization because we're not. We have nothing that in any way resembles a hierarchical form of government. We proved it, and you know it, and I know that's true. We're theocratic, and we're directed by uh, Christ Jesus as Jehovah's appointed king through his word and through his spirit, and uh, all those things were gone into under testimony, and you can see their purpose, can you not? We have to show ecclesiastical uh, powers residing in uh, our organization, and they do reside in our organization. No question about that. And if you think about the matter, among other things, it makes you appreciate so much what really uh, is in, included in an appointment that anyone might receive, and especially in this instant case, a pioneer might receive or a congregation servant might receive from the organization of God's people. It's not a casual matter. So you see the issues then were such as those, important and vital issues. And those were the things that were aired in court for nine days. Franz was on the stand uh, nearly two days. Covington was on the stand nearly two days. I was on the stand over a day. In uh, Scotland, witnesses are not allowed to be in the courtroom during the proceedings, which is a, intended as a safeguard against uh, one witness uh, hearing the previous testimony and then just uh, repeating it, you see. But uh, the court gave us permission and we were in the courtroom throughout the hearings. We from America. And I must say that we three were accorded the greatest respect both on and off the witness stand. And in Scotland, they take religion very seriously. And because of that fact, and uh, the fact that they don't intimidate witnesses there, and they didn't try to intimidate us, nor any of our other witnesses, and the uh, calm and uh, respectful and gentlemanly way the whole proceedings there were conducted made it possible for this uh, testimony to be developed, uh, not under opposition to everything you say, but in an atmosphere that was helpful and conducive to your giving a talk. Just the same as if you were calling on a friendly person at his door or on a back call, and in response to requests for information, were giving of all these things you know about the truth and God's organization, only on a a more uh, detailed and intimate scale even than you would encounter in your back calls. It was just like a great big Bible study all the time in that courtroom and uh, a study of the theocratic organization all the time in that courtroom. And Jehovah's Witnesses who were present uh, really learned something about their own, own organization, I can tell you that, as did the outsiders. The courtroom itself is not very large. The judge sits on a high uh, elevated place with his bench in, in front of him. And he's a lucky fellow. He has a little fireplace over here on his right. Well, that's a cold, cold building otherwise. They don't have central heating and that is the old parliament building as I told you before. Out in the court uh, room in front of him there's a little arena, square place where sits the clerk of the court. Just like the judge, he had on a wig and a gown. 
There the judge and the barristers uh, wear wigs and gowns. The wigs are made of horse hair. <laughs> it's uh, traditional with the British courts. They're not the big wigs. The big wigs come down, you may have seen them in pictures, but these are little wigs. They come down about so far and they're, they have uh, little uh, bangs like only they go up. Little hair sticks up in front here and round top and then on the sides there are lots of curls and curls in back and then down in back there are two little pigtails. <laughs> but you get used to them and they seem to fit the atmosphere of this very uh, august court of sessions of Scotland. Uh, the judge uh, wore his gowns too. He had a, a very pretty white wig the judge had. Lord Strawn, older man, but most of them had gray wigs. Miss Hutchinson is a nice pink-cheeked, uh, husky little blonde lady and uh, had nice brown hair, but over that nice brown hair she had this ugly old uh, horse hair wig. Comes down about as far as I've described, and of course the person's normal hair can be seen below uh, this wig. And they wear these gowns. The gowns are black. The judges had uh, a cross on either side, not a, a crucifix cross, but just the uh, regular cross of Scotland <clears throat> on each uh, side of his black gown. I don't know, someone suggested that maybe the idea started a uh, long time ago by a bald-headed judge in these cold, cold courtrooms of wearing a wig. And, <laughs> and I know those gowns are warm because they're lined. They can have anything underneath those gowns and keep warm. But I was cold in the courtroom a good bit of the time. One day I kept warm by wearing two suits, uh, both suits of long-handled underwear that I took along with me <laughs> that purpose. It was cold. We Americans had a little trouble over there with our health. And we all got uh, a little bit sick. They say the way to uh, uh, reduce is to go to England and uh, in this financial crisis there you lose a few pounds because pounds are the English money and I lost eight pounds but it wasn't the English money. That I lost. But we got used to it and forgot about about that after the case got started. Well, now on the judge's right is the jury box, and that was filled with uh, not jurymen, but with uh, newspaper reporters. One time there were 10 there. There were many all through the trial. And on the judge's left is the witness box, a little square place like this where the witness stands. So all the time you're on the witness stand or in the box, you stand up. If I was in, up there standing there all day, just like the, uh, Franz and Covington were, and Calves your legs get a little tired and you stand there all day. And then in back of you, there's a, a board in back of the witness that goes up and then curves over. It forms a kind of a canopy over the witness. It uh, may have some other uses, I don't know, or some other purpose, but one thing it does serve is to throw the sound of the witness's voice toward the judge. Then uh, here's the benches you see out front of this little courtroom, and over here's Leslie and uh, his associates, our opponents, and here's the dean and our other uh, legal representatives, then behind them our barristers, and then we were behind them, and then in back the rest of the benches were filled with Jehovah's Witnesses. And it was a wonderful thing up there on the witness stand to look down and see so many of your brothers uh, whom you knew were uh, praying for you, and uh, we knew the brothers in a, a many parts of the earth were too because uh, uh, the brothers who had associates or friends or acquaintances in the British Isles were informed of our case and were very much interested in it. <clears throat> we knew the Bethel family in Brooklyn were, and uh, we uh, realize now that those prayers were answered and were very grateful to Jehovah God for them. So it was a great spiritual help to see the brothers in the courtroom. The spectators are not allowed to stand. They only admit as many as can be seated. But around the walls, all the time, Coming and going were barristers who dropped into this, the most interesting courtroom in Scotland, between their various duties that required their attention elsewhere. So hundreds and hundreds of people uh, were in attendance uh, at different times throughout this two weeks and one day of these hearings. Now, on cross-examination, Leslie got off of the legal issues, we feel, onto religious issues that are irrelevant. 
chiefly. But he had a purpose. I'm not saying that he is a foolish lawyer. He's a good lawyer, but uh, his case uh, was not made so well, we feel. Of course, the uh, judge may feel otherwise. We don't have his decision yet. That's due the first week of January. But to illustrate uh, the uh, effort that was made to create prejudice in the minds of the court against us, let me say this, that the questions that Leslie asked showed that he and his associates had done much research into uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, but not in our publications alone but in the publications of our enemies who lie about us and publish all kinds of untruths and half-truths for the express purpose of creating prejudice against us and the woods are full of them and we don't pay any attention to them but those publications were in the possession of uh, the crown and their questions showed that they were primed in large part by such publications. For instance, at one uh, point, Leslie said, isn't it uh, true that Judge Rutherford uh, hated and uh, heaped reproach upon all the preachers how would you answer a question like that on the witness stand before the court of sessions? So it was discussed and uh, it was explained and pointed out uh, concerning our beliefs respecting the religious organizations of Christendom. And uh, no exception was attempted as far as the Presbyterian Church of Scotland is concerned. But the truth was spoken and uh, Brother Rutherford's uh, viewpoint that was established by quotations that were uh, produced by the Crown from our own publications uh, were, uh, was supported, you see, with the truth of the Bible. So religious prejudice was uh, attempted to be made. And also patriotic prejudice. For instance, uh, Leslie said, didn't Judge Rutherford uh, say that uh, England was the seat of the beast? And, of course, it was testified to in reply, yes, in 1926, Judge Rutherford gave a speech in London, and he said that uh, this is the very seat of the beast. Oh, do Jehovah's Witnesses still believe that and teach that? No. Because in the light book itself, Judge Rutherford showed that uh, England is not the beast, the two-horned beast, but the two-horned beast represents the Anglo-American uh, power, and that was uh, developed and explained, you see. Or well, do Jehovah's Witnesses still believe that? Certainly, and then uh, it was explained and discussed. And then at one point, less than and in an effort to trip him up, Brother Franz was on the stand for that particular question. Franz said, uh, which beast do you mean, Mr. Leslie? Mr. Leslie says, you are the expert, Mr. Franz. You should tell me which, be which beast. <laughs> well, Leslie got all balled up in this uh, zoo or menagerie of the beasts of Revelation. And while they were explained uh, piecemeal, he never understood. He never saw the light. And when he'd get off on the beasts, and he harped a lot on Michael and our uh, teaching that Michael is uh, the name of Jesus and his pre-human existence, which is true. But he couldn't understand it and uh, dwelled on it so much. And when he'd get on those two things or either of them, the dean would make the remark to us, there's those Leslie uh, chasing his spiritual rabbit. <laughs> that was all right for our case and the thing of it is that that line of cross-examination only served to emphasize and elaborate and enlarge upon the truth the message from God's word you see 
because none of our witnesses backed down and there wasn't a thing said by any of the seven men who gave testimony in our case that did aught but honor Jehovah's name and his word and uphold his organization and his people. And we're grateful that that's the case. And I can assure you that such is the case. And so the, the, uh, the cross-examination served chiefly to highlight and emphasize and enlarge upon the direct examination and the points we were endeavoring to establish. In uh, Scotland, there's a disease among the rabbits now. Tularemia is one of its names. And one time the dean says, there he goes after his spiritual rabbit again, and when he catches him, he's going to find it has tularemia. <laughs> <laughs> one time when uh, a witness was describing our establishment at 117 Adams Street, then the printing work done there, Leslie made the remark, something like non-union labor. And at that juncture, the judge interrupted, as he did quite often, sometimes to get information from the witness, sometimes to get information from the barrister, sometimes to uh, uh, counsel the barrister, talking, whoever it was, the dean or Leslie. And uh, the judge said, is it necessary, Mr. Leslie, to de develop this material here? And Leslie said, uh, but to the effect, yes, I have a point in mind I want to bring out. Of course, his point actually was he's trying to show that we're just a book-selling organization, you see. And uh, then uh, the witness, it was Brother Covington on the stand at that particular time, he said, uh, now about this, this point of, uh, oh, he went ahead and answered the uh, first part of the question. Then he said, now about this point of non-union labor, he started to comment on that. And you know what Leslie said to him? He said, just forget that. And Covington said, well, since you've injected it into the case, I'd like to make a comment on it. And then of all things, Leslie said this, all right, if you must. And then Brother Covington commented on it at length and explain that it's not fair to compare our religious community with uh, a, a union labor or non-union labor. We're not in competition with labor. It isn't anything like that, and gave a fine statement of the facts concerning that. Then when Covington was through, the judge said to Leslie, uh, Mr. Leslie, I wonder if it is necessary to develop this kind of material at this point. And then Leslie said this, my Lord, I didn't expect the question to be answered. <laughs> and the judge said, Mr. Leslie, I would advise you not to ask questions that you do not want to have answered. <laughs> All on a level, level plane, said quietly, nobody excited, but a terrific rebuke from the court. And there were many such given, uh, with one exception, all of them to Leslie. The dean got rebuked at one point too and, and uh, uh, for letting uh, or developing a line of testimony beyond the point of moderation, as the judge expressed it. And Franz is on the witness stand giving some long speech about disfellowshipping. It's amazing, but it's true. Disfellowshipping was gone into from stem to stern and probation and uh, reinstatement and all that, you see. It was good. It showed there's an organization on the earth that's governing itself according to God's word, the Bible. And it was appropriate to discussion of ministers. And it was gone into, on cross-examination and direct examination. Another time to uh, uh, ridicule the idea uh, we have little children as our ministers. Brother Covington was uh, finally admitted under cross-examination that he knew of a child once as long, young as eight years of age who was immersed. You see, very exceptional things were highlighted as being the rule. But uh, all witnesses testifying maintained the scriptural position that the Bible does not set a minimum age 
But what the Bible does show regarding a dedication and the responsibility and discretion and the responsibility upon children too. Well, in examining uh, another one of the witnesses, the judge uh, or the attorney for the crown, Leslie said, uh, turn to, uh, uh, he's talking to me at the time, he said, turn to make sure of all things to the index. That was one of the pieces in evidence. As I said, most of our publications were in evidence and referred to constantly. So I turned to the index. He said, you see Jesus Christ indexed there. Yes. Under Jesus Christ, you see the word metempsychosis. Yes. At what age is a little child, or a wee bairn, as he said, supposed to understand metempsychosis? and the meaning of that word. So it was explained that he might not understand the meaning of the word or be able to define that word, but he would understand that Jesus Christ was not his father, that it wasn't God in a human form or it wasn't a case of a, a human body with a spirit creature inside of him and that was developed and elaborated on in language that a child could understand. That's what a child understands. No child can make a dedication if he doesn't understand that. You see, that's fundamental. But Leslie couldn't understand it. He's a, almost a Presbyterian minister. He just avoided that horrible fate by a narrow margin, <laughs> got into the law. So he said to me after I got through, uh, don't you think that is a difficult thing for a child to understand. He never called me Mr. Souter. He always called me Mr. Grant Souter with his broad brogue because Grant's a common name in Scotland. He liked to work it over. It lent itself to his brogue, you see, an R in it. And I said, no, I think that is a very simple thing and easy to understand. The fact is it's much more easy to understand how Jesus was not his heavenly father than it would be to try to understand how he was his heavenly father, which is true, of course, also. In uh, uh, developing the testimony, of course, the uh, time came when Brother Walsh must go on the stand. We witnesses from America got along all right. We were allowed to speak till we were finished. Sometimes in uh, answering a question, you'd give an answer and uh, maybe have an afterthought on it, something you wanted to add. Might be a scripture, might be a comment. <clears throat> we were allowed to add those afterthoughts. And I only know of one or two instances where any of our American witnesses were interrupted in their testimony. And one of those times I have referred to when Brother Franz was uh, giving a discussion of disfellowshipping and instead of getting to the point or citing the heart of the scriptures involved he started to lay a background and of all things he started to talk about the case in Corinthians that Paul uh, spoke of where the disfellowshipping was uh, had by Paul and then later on in Corinthians reinstated you remember and it's a long thing and requires some background and Franz was giving all that and that's took him a long time and he never did get it all finished. He never got to the point of that particular argument he was making because he was interrupted as I've said. But otherwise uh, we were not interrupted. Uh, Franz uh, appreciated uh, the attitude of the court very much and uh, while I started to mention Brother Walsh I'll go back to Franz for a minute to tell you something very interesting that occurred. After the, his first day of testimony, he said to me, we were roommates at the hotel, I think it would be nice if uh, I express my appreciation to the judge before uh, I leave. He said, I think I'll do that when they're through with me on the witness stand. Or there they say the box, in the witness box. So I thought about the matter and it seemed a good idea to me and I told Fred that I thought that would be a good thing to do, be very nice and appropriate, because I know Brother Franz, 
And I know anything that he would say under such circumstances would be gracious and good and to the point and carry weight. It wouldn't just be a lot of words. So um, the next uh, day when they were finished with him and the dean said, thank you, I have no more. The judge said, uh, thank you to Franz. I was the only one in the courtroom that was not surprised when Franz turned to the judge and said, Your Lordship, before I leave the uh, witness stand, I want to say, this is in effect almost his words, I want to say how much I appreciate the courtesy I've been accorded in giving testimony here and your patience in listening to the evidence and uh, when I go back to America I shall always be glad to speak of it uh, favorably. Well, the uh, ones who were in the know in uh, that courtroom were flabbergasted. Because you don't thank a judge for hearing your testimony. You don't give any possible implication that you thank a judge for doing his job. It's not ethical. It's uh, contempt, reproach, you see. And Mosquito, he pulled in his <laughs> neck and <laughs> the dean looked over at Leslie and they looked at each other while Fran was giving his little speech. I was listening and I was just hoping now bring it to a close, Freddie. Don't talk too long. <laughs> but he made his points. It took him a little while to say those few sentences. And then Lord Strawn said, uh, we're in, we are indebted to you, Mr. Franz, for <coughs> the uh, testimony you've given here, and you may be assured that uh, it will receive every consideration. Oh, everybody was relieved. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, Mosquito said, I thought they were going to put him in jail. I thought they were going to hang and corner him. I thought we were all going to be in jail. You see, it just isn't done. And Mosquito turned to me and he said, don't you do a thing like that. <laughs> and he says to Covington, don't you do a thing like that either. Of course, it would have been entirely out of order for it to have been repeated. It would have made it common. It would have been absolutely wrong for Covington to do it because he's supposed to know something about court procedure, even in Scotland. And I wouldn't do it. But it was so obvious throughout the testimony that Franz was an unsophisticated uh, man, a, a theological expert immersed in things of the Bible. And what he said uh, fell from his lips graciously, and the judge made a gracious rejoinder in return. It was an amazing thing, and the newspapers took it up, and they all published this the event in the court of sessions where the dignity of the court might have been stepped up on but it was not <laughs> the court uh, formalities there while they are, are on a very uh, gracious level they're very strict and uh, the barristers and others go around in circles at the behest of the judge, as I've intimated before. They're men above them. And the European class distinction is very noticeable. And we respected the court too. But we were able, all of us, to speak the truth. We're not intimidated by the court. The dean in uh, developing the testimony going over the tenants one by one repeatedly for corroborative testimony would say thus and so is what you believe yes that's true according to your belief you see according to your belief well that made the point in our favor that it was our belief and uh, set us as a unique 
uh, religious denomination as far as our tenants were concerned, but it also made the point for everybody to know if they were so inclined to listen that it was not the dean's belief. And so in spite of the fact that we feel he did a good job, uh, don't anyone have the idea that he is in the truth because of his handling the truth well. He did uh, a good job. We appreciate his service, but others did as well. They did uh, well also. And everybody that was speaking in the court, the judge and the uh, macer, the, the man who in the parade of the justices and lords carries the mace, is the macer in the court, and he hands the exhibits to the witnesses and to the court for the court to see when he so desires. He compares to the clerk here in the United States, but there the clerk performs the other functions I've described. Well, all of them were using a theocratic vocabulary from almost to the outset of the case, as you can readily see, and discussing back and forth uh, these terms. So then came the time for the witnesses following the American witnesses to take the stand. And that was on uh, Wednesday of the second week of the trial. And Brother Price Hughes, the branch servant of England, took the stand to testify regarding the procedures in the London branch to show that they were the same as uh, prescribed by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, to describe his ecclesiastical powers by virtue of the power attorney of attorney which he holds from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, and the appointment of Brother Walsh to show that he was appointed in the regular way, you see. He had to build this up and uh, make a complete showing respecting Walsh. So Hughes was on the stand almost all day, too, under direct and uh, cross-examination. And uh, in order for a more clear presentation to be given concerning the financial matters of the International Bible Students Association, than uh, Brother uh, Hughes was able to give on uh, Wednesday night of the second week, we telephoned London and, and had Brother Chitty come up on the night train. He's the secretary and treasurer of the International Bible Students Association. So he arrived as a surprise witness on uh, Thursday morning, took the stand and produced the audited accounts of the International Bible Students Association because that's a British corporation they have to have their accounts audited. At this juncture I want to digress while I think about it and say that there was a detailed examination both direct and cross examination of myself on the finances of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania and also of New York and at no time then or thereafter and at no time in this entire case has there been the slightest intimation of any fraud or uh, any questioning of our finances. And there was none of Brother Chitty. What he had was accepted. And that uh, regarding the American corporations, in spite of the fact that in America we are not required by law to uh, conform to the regulations they are in Britain under their corporation laws of auditing and so forth. Now, uh, Chitty gave testimony briefly concerning the statements he had with him, financial statements, and then the Crown asked for a recess so that they could examine those statements. They had two accountants in the court with them. They were there while I was on the witness stand, and I really expected uh, terrific cross-examination on our finances, but there was none. There was cross-examination, but there was nothing that was any difficulty to our case nor to me personally. And so after about 20 minutes recess in which they examined the statements, Chitty resumed his uh, testimony and then was under uh, cross-examination, gave splendid testimony, and then he was followed by Walsh, the brother that this case is all about and on, in whose behalf the society had spent thousands and thousands of dollars to defend he was somewhat of an unknown quantity to us, that is, uh, he's a quiet boy. You'd say he was a Scottish lad, although born in England because he's been raised in Scotland and he speaks with a Scottish accent 
and isn't much of a talker. And in preparation for trial, his responses were meager and uh, brief, accurate. He didn't seem to express himself freely. We didn't know how expressive he'd be on the witness stand. And we tried to impress him that he must talk when he had an opportunity and give uh, full answers and be a responsive witness. We had confidence in him because he was a Jehovah's servant. The case was important. And he was a good pioneer and a, a good congregation servant. In uh, preparing him for uh, the hearing, he made a good impression on our solicitors, as I've mentioned, and on our barristers. Well, let me tell you that he was the best witness of all because he substantiated in person all the things that had been testified to regarding our organization, especially on the issues of youthfulness, because of his youth when he came into the truth and what he had done thereafter. The judge was interested in all of our witnesses and in all that was said, but he was intensely interested in Walsh. Walsh is a good-looking young man of 20, as I've said, fair-complected, pink-cheeked like most of the people in Scotland are. He had on a, a new suit that he'd procured for the occasion. He was dressed neatly, and uh, his responses were wonderful. And he showed his work how he had, uh, at the age of 12, found error in the teachings of the Scottish Church and showed it and showed the points that impressed him. And he was impressed by the points of eternal torment and the destruction of the earth at first, primarily, you see, as a little lad and uh, showed his progress and then his present uh, appointment and his present uh, position in the organization of God's people. He was testifying there, and an old mosquito turned around to me, and he said, uh, they're not getting anything off of that lad. He's damn good. <laughs> <laughs> Franz was sitting next to me, and uh, I said, yes, he's uh, getting along fine. And Franz said, yes, he, he's good. The mosquito said, he's not good. He's damn good. <laughs> But he meant it. He was sincere. After uh, Walsh stepped down from the stand, he turned around and he said, I'd be proud if my own son would do as well on the witness stand or in the witness box. Skeeter has a family that he's very attached to and loves very much and thinks the world of his children, although he himself is not a, a religious man. He does respect the truth. And he was very elated over Walsh's testimony. And this uh, was on Thursday, as I indicated, the second week. Well, now we had one witness after Walsh, a man named Hopley, Brother Hopley, who's been over here and gone to Gilead School and who's the circus servant and was such when uh, Walsh was appointed congregation servant. Well, Hopley had been excluded from the trial all those two weeks. He just had to cool his heels in the witness uh, room, didn't hear how things were going, he didn't know the things had simmered down through these two weeks and the speeches were all over. The Americans gave all the long-winded speeches on the witness stand and then Hopley came on and he started in all over again. And uh, the dean uh, restricted his testimony. The dean restricted uh, Walsh's testimony too uh, because uh, Walsh proved to be very responsive on the witness stand. The dean called for yes and, and no's sometimes instead of extensive speeches that Walsh was prepared to make. You see. Well, Walsh made his uh, extensive speeches under cross-examination, much to the consternation of the cross-examiner. So with Hopley, and he gave a fine, strong finish to uh, our case, the last witness with all the force and fire that he had. He spoke boldly. He's a man 59 years of age, as I recall his age, or thereabouts, and uh, capable, handles himself well, and speaks well. And he was all keyed up for two weeks. He primed himself for his moment in the witness box. <laughs> and he made the most of it in the short time that he had, and he substantiated what had been testified to by Hughes and Walsh regarding Walsh's appointments. An effort was made constantly in the hearings to minimize the importance of our theocratic ministry school and uh, 
that it is not a, in a, a deep school, it's casual, it's not too important. And you should have heard the things that were testified to by we seven who gave testimony on those points. We believe what we said is true. That's true regarding the other meetings of our people in our congregational organizations, in our servants, in our pioneers. Some very, very wonderful things were testified to regarding Jehovah's people that are true, regarding the things he's provided that are true, and our meetings were one of those things. It makes you appreciate and love God's organization all the more to uh, think of those points, dwell upon them, and when you're immersed in them for uh, three weeks, and breathe them and then speak to, the, uh, to them under oath in the witness stand, uh, you're convinced in your heart and mind that those things are precious. We thought that about the theocratic ministry school and the, Leslie was trying to show it wasn't up to much. We testified that we have, for instance, the study of comparative religion. And uh, failing on all the other witnesses to disprove the fact, he started on Walsh and says, in, uh, your theocratic ministry school, do you study comparative religion? Walsh said, yes, sir. Or he said, I. He says, I, that's the Scottish word for yes. Leslie said, do you study Zoroastrianism? Walsh thought a minute and said, no. Well, of course, he was wrong there, really, because we have studied a little about Zoroastrian, uh, Zoroaster, and that's the religion of Zoroaster. And Leslie said, uh, do you uh, study the Vedas? Well, just thought a minute and said, yes, sir. Leslie said, what religion are they connected with? He's fishing you know, all the time. Walsh said, uh, after a thoughtful minute, uh, uh, Muslim or Mohammedanism. Well, Leslie let it go. <laughs> Leslie didn't know the difference. <laughs> It's the Quran that's the holy book of Muslim, uh, of Islam, Mohammedanism, and the Vedas are holy books of India, the book, holy books of the Hindus. Fishing expedition that failed, still after the spiritual rabbit. I'd gotten all primed to give them a speech on the beasts of Revelation, as I mentioned before, and they never asked me that, but they uh, stayed clear of that. But these other a doctrinal points they developed on all witnesses. And uh, unfortunately, both Walsh and uh, Hopley, or Walsh and uh, Hughes were deprived also of a discussion of the book of Revelation. Well, now the crown had no witnesses to put on the stand because we were the pursuers. We had to prove our case. And uh, with the conclusion of Hopley's testimony, which was at uh, 3.45 on Thursday night of the second week of the trial, the next thing in order was the argument of the attorneys. Now, similarly to the way the, the evidence was given, so the arguments went. That is to say, uh, our side was heard first in a summary as the duties of the barristers on this occasion to summarize the evidence that's been given, point out law and precedent in previous decisions, and to guide the judge in his decisions on the case. And of course, that argument goes into the record too. Everything that's said is taken down by the court reporters and typed up. So the next day we had typed, or rather mimeographed copies of all the previous day's uh, proceedings. We got that when we went to court the next day. Now, that would be true regarding the summation. The uh, a judge said to the dean instantly, just as soon as the last witness was seated, are you ready to begin your speech? They call it a speech. It is a speech. We'd say a summation or argument. And like that, the dean says, yes, my lord. But I'm also willing to wait until tomorrow. The court ends at four o'clock. It was a quarter to four. Judge said, will you finish? Are you sure you will finish tomorrow? That would be Friday. The dean wouldn't commit himself to finish. He said, I believe I will, but I can't be sure. The judge said, then you had better uh, 
uh, take the time that's remaining of today and get started on your speech. So he launched right into it. And uh, Franz and I heard his speech for 23 minutes before he reached a convenient point to close at eight after four, and it was continued the following day. Now, if I can go back to the previous weekend, we had a meeting in Glasgow uh, the middle weekend of our trial, you see, after we'd had a trial for a week. We went over to Glasgow, Scotland, and had a meeting with the brothers from Scotland who assembled there to the total of 1,954. And uh, three missionaries came over from Dublin to be with us. Three sisters who'd been at uh, Bethel for a while, gone through Gilead, and had been missionaries in Era for several years now. And they brought with them the very urgent request from the brothers in Dublin that some of us, or, all, or that all of us, would see them in Dublin before we came home. Well, now, it was difficult to decide on that request. Covington couldn't go. Franz and I uh, decided, however, that we would forego Friday's proceedings in the court and uh, go to Dublin for Friday and then still get home, you see, on that weekend. We did that. So that's the reason we left uh, Thursday night at the conclusion of the beginning of the Dean's speech. And we drove to Glasgow, Scotland, and stayed all night there and took a plane for Dublin Friday morning. We had a meeting with the Dublin brothers Friday night. And uh, there were 193 present. A, a wonderful turnout in, in Dublin. And uh, as elsewhere, they send their love to you. Well, now, in the portion of the Dean's... Uh, argument that we heard, he was excellent. He concluded his speech the next day, Friday, and gave an excellent summation. The Crown began its argument Friday evening and concluded Tuesday of the third week. And that concluded the case except for the decision. And the judge, Lord Strawn, reserved decision and said that will be handed down the first week of, that is the week of January the 3rd. So we will not have long to wait for that decision. For uh, his uh, opening points, the dean established the fact that the law does not say a religious organization must be a Christian religious organization any religious organization. But in this case, uh, we're dealing with a Christian organization. It's been proved such. The uh, court should not be bound by the holdings in the Salt Marsh case to which I've made reference. He pointed out how those cases were not applicable in this case. And uh, that there was a decision back in 1917 that held that we were a religious denomination. So that while there was nothing in Scottish precedent against the dean, he says, everything that there is is in my favor. In their speeches, they use uh, the first person singular, referring to their case or their client or their side. They say, my, it's all in my favor, he pointed out to the judge. He showed that... Uh, it was necessary that the judge find that we are a religious denomination because of our tenets, substantial membership. It was testified to uh, on the basis of our New Year book figures, which Brother Nor gave to us just 15 minutes before he left uh, for the South, where he is now. And just four hours before we left, he gave uh, me those figures and said we could uh, release them to the brothers we met in uh, Scotland and elsewhere. And they're in the yearbook now, showing we have uh, 580,000 ministers and uh, that if the judge does find that we are a religious denomination, he has to find that our ministers are regular ministers of religion. Then during the latter part of his uh, discussion, we did not hear at all, but he did develop the fact 
that the uh, court does not have the right to look into our tenets. He was discussing our tenets as uh, establishing us as a religious organization, de or denomination rather, and the court said, I will have to examine into their tenets to see if they are reasonable or examine them as to their reasonableness before I can decide that they are a religious denomination. And the dean spoke up to the judge and said, no, you may not examine as to the reasonableness of their tenets. They're their tenets. And you have no right, he said in effect, to examine their tenets, whether they're reasonable or whether they are unreasonable, you see. And he's right. And uh, we hope that the judge feels that way about it. He might not think our tenets are reasonable. They're not in accordance with the tenets of the Church of Scotland or the Presbyterian Church. In the uh, course of the uh, Crown's summation, Leslie pointed out that uh, our tenets change. He had gone into much uh, length during the testimony to show we have changed our viewpoints on various things, uh, even to the extent that once when Brother Covington was being cross-examined on the point, he said, yes, the churches never have to change because they never learn any, anything. <laughs> but that was a point he made, to see, to try to show that we're not dependable, but are vague. And then he examined into our uh, uh, distribution of literature again to show uh, contrary to the evidence that was testified to that uh, we are a, a book distributing point I've, or uh, organization I've mentioned that point before and he went off again into the uh, uh, patriotic angle and the matter of calling the churches synagogues of Satan and the fact we used to say that we're not a religious organization it had all been explained and gone into thoroughly in testimony see our our organization beliefs have been aired extensively. He took a whole day to talk about those things and contended that we are not a religious denomination under the law. Well, now the judge said to him, in effect, the dean points out that I must find the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society to be a religious denomination under the law. And that if I do... I must find that their congregation servants are regular ministers of religion under the law. That now what do you have that you can uh, give me that will help me decide on this point? That is to say, what uh, cases can you cite? And the uh, Crown Council, Leslie said, I have nothing to add, in effect. said, I rest my case upon the contention that they are not a religious denomination, and that's the strongest part of our case, you see. Well, then the judge said to him, Leslie says that I must find that the pioneers are uh, not called porters, but are regular ministers of religion under the law. What have you to say to me to help me decide that point? And uh, again, Leslie said he had nothing to add, that uh, he rested his contention upon the uh, claim that we are not a religious denomination. It's amazing. The only case that was cited outside of those I've mentioned was the Dickinson case, and that was cited by the dean in his argument, an American case, if you please. The judge had evidenced much interest in both the Canadian and the American proceedings and uh, decisions. And the Dickinson case is right to point because there was a man, you know about the Dickinson case, we've read about it, it was in the, in the court here, Supreme Court, a man who was both a pioneer and a uh, congregation servant, just like Walsh. So nothing further was offered by the Crown in their summation, and we feel that they did not make a case. It's not the first time we felt that the uh, opposition hadn't made a case, and we had, and we lost the decision, so we're not prophesying the decision. But here, after it was all over, Leslie said to Covington, and telling him goodbye, 
You know that as a lawyer, I have a job to do in this case, but I wish you success. And we don't know what the man meant. The judge had already stated during the uh, uh, argument that his mind was made up on the question as to whether or not we are a religious denomination under the law unless Mr. Leslie could change his mind. He didn't say what his opinion was, but uh, it looks like he may feel that there's some merit in our argument that we are a religious denomination under the law. However, in uh, discussing this case with our brothers in uh, the British Isles and in, in era, as we did, we were very careful to point out to them that the case must not assume undue importance. But the fact is, it doesn't make any difference to us whether we get a favorable decision or an unfavorable decision. We want a favorable decision. That's why the case was fought. But uh, it isn't going to change anything what the judge decides. We're not dependent upon the de decision of one man whether we're Jehovah's ministers or not or his witnesses or our relationship to him does not depend upon some judge's decision. Because whether we get a favorable decision or an unfavorable one, we have won a spiritual victory. And that's important for us to have in mind here too so that we'll not uh, give this or any other case undue importance. They're, they are important. But the importance of... Uh, uh, this case, it seems to me, beyond the immediate effect that a favorable decision could have or a favorable decision upon appeal could have, is the great spiritual benefit that has come to those of us who've had to do with the case and that has come by Jehovah's undeserved kindness to those brothers in Scotland particularly that have been immersed in this case all year and are all wrapped up in it and have come to a greater appreciation of God's organization. And we hope that it will be used by Jehovah to help fire and enthuse those brothers to more faithful and zealous activity in the field so they can shake off this lethargy that has crept over the British Isles in comparison with the forward movement of the Lord's organization elsewhere in the earth. And maybe it will have that effect because... The brothers there tell us the Scottish field is ripe for expansion and the interest is increasing. Another good result from it that made it worthwhile is the tremendous amount of publicity that we received. I have some of the clippings here. I'll leave them here on the platform. If anybody wants to look them over, they can. Dozens of the hundreds that were carried in all the newspapers, many of them on the front page throughout the hearings, including a fine report of the summation by the two barristers at the conclusion of the trial so that everyone in Scotland certainly and throughout the British Isles and in many other parts of the earth know that Jehovah's Witnesses are an organization to contend with in Scotland and that they are uh, to be accepted their work is to be uh, taken for granted and that th their ministers occupy a holy office and their activities are not a casual affair. And those things are true. In uh, meeting with the brothers in the various places, they showed their application to the study. They're good students, our brothers in the British Isles. But they show their need, too, of further spiritual maturity, not merely knowledge, of uh, the printed word and we hope that they'll be aided in this respect through these hearings and the fine uh, 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 recommendation that they have been to their work throughout that part of the land. So these things rest in the hands of Jehovah and uh, we continue to ask his blessing upon the outcome of the proceedings so that his name will be honored and his people will be further blessed. There are many, many things that might be mentioned concerning the case that are of interest and uh, in various ways and are thrilling, but perhaps the report that has been given is sufficient to give you an idea of the issues that are involved, how vital they are, 
and uh, the purpose of the society in proceeding to the extent it has in this case. It's of interest to us, the same as Canadian cases are of interest to us, and just as important for the work in Scotland as the decisions in Canada have been to the work in Canada, or uh, those in the United States are to the work in the United States. It's all part of our uh, united fight for free worship and the proclamation of the kingdom message. And we're grateful for these things because they center our attention more upon the work that we have to do, and it helps us realize that through his direction of his people during the past several years, and especially since by God's direction we have uh, altered our organizational structure, beginning in 1931, as the facts show, the history shows it, there's no doubt about it, those provisions on the part of Jehovah God are what enabled us to have in our hands and to put into the hands of our attorneys the material with which to fight this case successfully. And it has been fought successfully and without any regrets on our part regardless of what the decision may be. We are grateful for the work performed by all of our solicitors and our uh, barristers, and we so told them. They were able to grasp our organization and our teachings and express them to others in the trial, which is an evidence of the clarity of our organization and our teachings. It was not necessary to conceal or hide or apologize for a single thing that God's people have done. They were examined into all these things that were scrutinized under the magnifying glass there in the courtroom. We don't have to apologize for the conduct of our people, for the things they believe, for the changes in their point of view of doctrine, for our distribution of the Bible and Bible literatures, for all of our back calls and Bible study work, all the things that are being done we were proud of and could give testimony on. And we don't have to apologize for our organizational structure our incorporation, and especially for our theocratic organization. It was asked by Leslie of one of the witnesses then, if there was no board of directors, there'd be no governing body, would there? And he was answered, of course, because there was no board of directors in the time of the early church when the governing body was located in Jerusalem. And if there was no corporation, no board of directors, Jehovah's work would go on just the same because it's under his direction and it is his anointed and his other sheep that are carrying on this work in unity throughout the world. Well, that was made plain and that's what establishes our organization as theocratic and not hierarchical. So it's a very great privilege that uh, we had to have a part in the case. It's a privilege to me to discuss it with you and tell you about it. I hope that the discussion has been of some interest to you and enlightening and I thank you very much. I'll turn the meeting back now to Brother Tedesco. The seven congregations from this area that responded to hear your report, Brother Souter, certainly want to thank you for it. We appreciate it. However, we appreciate more the fact that you brought these things to our attention, which uh, gives us a keener appreciation of our responsibility as Jehovah's Witnesses. And as you stated, it makes no difference what sort of a decision this judge will give. We're still servants of Jehovah God. We're his ministers. We've been commissioned by him. We'll keep that in mind. For instance, tomorrow, the text is very important. It states that 12, these 12 Jesus sent forth, giving them these orders. As you go, preach saying, the kingdom of the heavens has drawn near. Now, how many tomorrow will accomplish that very thing? How many tomorrow will do that? Raise your hands. We have all these congregation here. 
to find response. So tomorrow morning, the Rosetta congregation will meet at this particular location. And Brother Hannon will talk to us for a while. Now, if you'll all rise, we'll conclude with song 59, number 59. Suter, will you express thanks to Jehovah? 